Hi and welcome to the Avenue Code Extraordinary Woman in Tech podcast. Here you'll find inspiring conversations about technology, inclusion and diversity. If you are listening to us from podcast platforms, be sure to follow us. And if you are watching us on YouTube, subscribe to our channel. Hi everyone, I'm Anna Vanderwall, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing two incredible women. We have with us Melissa Ostra, who is the founder and owner at Got Style, and we also have our very own Holly Campanez, who is the director of Dot Design Avenue Code's Creative Services Division. So welcome, ladies. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having us. So Melissa, let's start with you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your career path to creating Got Style? What was the inspiration behind this? Um, I always think when it comes to starting a business, it's always about solving a problem. So for me at this time, it was 17 years ago and uh, the men of Toronto dressed like shit. <laughs> it was um, all Ed Hardy t-shirts and true religion jeans. And if I had to continue to look at the men in Toronto, then they might as well dress better. So I was doing a lot of traveling in Europe and seeing how the men in Europe dress. It's like, we need to, I need to bring this into Toronto or else the women of Toronto will not be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, I don't believe I've ever heard of a business problem framed in quite this way before, but I like it. Holly, do you want to tell us about the business problem that led to dot design and also tell us how you knew you wanted to lead it? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the best moments in our careers are when personal passions come together with something that will further the business. And dot design was that. Uh, it was exactly that for me. So Avenue Code is, of course, a global digital transformation and evolution consultancy. We've been in business since 2008. And as part of the portfolio of services that we offered, we started to really realize the power of design and design and creative services to create strong impact. Uh, so one of the things that really became quickly apparent to me is that design is hugely powerful in the modern world, whether that be powerful for driving revenue and profitability, uh, that's one side of it, but also powerful for shaping the way that people perceive reality. And if you think about it, digital interfaces are really where people are creating their perceptions and their narratives and understanding about what it means to be human, what it means to interact with other people. And so when I started realizing how important design is and the role that it plays, uh, that really spoke to me. And I thought, I, I want to create a way in which we can elevate the voices of designers from backgrounds that traditionally have not had a voice and that have not been heard in the conversation. So for me, dot design is that perfect marriage of my personal passions and something that really had a huge impact in a positive way for our client portfolio and, and for Avenue Code as a whole. Mm, that's lovely to hear. It seems so rare, and yet it strikes me that both of you have done this. So that's, that's yeah. pretty unique. So Melissa, uh, one of the things that we've really noticed about you and admire about you is that you're really incredible at um, innovating in an industry that's been retail, right? It's been somewhat slow to change, and it's traditionally dragged its feet somewhat, and yet <laughs> You have this instinct for just picking up on the right trends or even pioneering those trends yourself. So I'm curious if you can tell us how you've honed those instincts for what's worth trying. Um, and I, I so agree with you when, when you say how oh, this industry is so archaic. I was at a buying appointment and they're still doing the orders on a three piece, you know, paper that you've got it like, I'm just like, you don't have this digitally. <laughs> you mean the, what? So it, it, it has been very slow. And I think, um, I think because since I started off in men's and again, dealing with the client that I was dealing with, which were not only the finance guys, not only the lawyers, but a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of tech guys, they kind of opened my world um, into the possibility of what we can make retail. And I'm passionate about, there was a stage for a long time where, you know, the retail apocalypse, that retail is over, brick and mortar is dead. It's all online only. And I really disagree with that. So it's more, how do we add things in to make lives easier so they'll still want to shop in store? So it's definitely throwing a lot of things at the wall, We've definitely been early at a lot of things. We actually launched or tried to launch um, video shopping probably about 10 years ago. <laughs> and this is when nobody was FaceTiming. So it was like, it was a little too new, but 
Um, but I think sometimes you have to try that. You got to try things. You're going to fail. You're going to be too early, but you still got to keep trying again and again. And I think it's just different ways to shake up how we view shopping. And again, our end goal is always, what can we do to make our customer lives easier? If we do this, will it make their shopping easier? Will it make their life easier? So that's always what we're kind of having in the back of the mind when we're trying out new technology. That's really fascinating. And it's interesting for me to hear you say that you were too early in trying a lot of these. I'm curious then, did you reintroduce some of these ideas subsequently when you felt that the was yeah. right? Yeah. So um, yeah, when we first launched video shopping, again, nobody was even FaceTiming. <laughs> so it was, nobody was into it. And now of course they keep saying, you know, live shopping, live streaming is going to be the next big thing in retail. So we are doing lives weekly. We're going to start doing live shopping again. We actually did um, during COVID, during lockdown, the, the first lockdown, we did um, a live shopping event on uh, Boxing Day. So in Canada, Boxing Day is bigger than Black Friday. And what we did is myself and the store manager, we did a live shopping event and we would do a shot with every sale that we'd win live. <laughs> So it was a great way to get people engaged because they wanted to see how drunk they could get us. <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> you know, you never think of innovation, <laughs> whiskey, but you know, that's very clever. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> um, so Holly, I'm curious for you too, you're, you're kind of in a similar position, but in a way it's completely inverted, right? Because you're, it, you're really pioneering a lot of emerging technologies in a very new industry. So for you, I'm curious about how you and your team are defining where to build. That's a great question, but I think the first thing I need to say is, Melissa, have I mentioned that I want to come work with you? <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I think what's so great about that story is like it, it speaks to innovation isn't um, innovation isn't necessarily trying to change people. It's just trying to speak to what's always been there, what it means to be human in new ways and finding new ways to bring that out and kind of like shine up different facets of it. So I think for my line of work, you know, we have to walk a really fine line between what the end user or the consumer or the participant actually needs and wants versus what stakeholders are willing to invest in, which is not always the same thing. And there's, there's a good bit of like trial and error. There's a good bit of feeling it out of testing. Uh, sometimes you might be too early for something as Melissa was sharing. Sometimes you might be too late. You're just like hopping on a bandwagon and the users aren't into it anymore because it's not this shiny new emerging thing. But I think for us, you know, for really for our role as consultants, it's about conciliating what we know from the market, what we know that users are actually responding well to, what has brought great results for people in similar industries, and then conciliating that with what are the stakeholders goals. Uh, and there's a handful of times that we've had to really just have an honest conversation with a prospective client and say, you know, I think you're you're doing this to do it. Uh, and I don't think it's going to bring the results that you are hoping to have. So the, the number one thing that I would say to anybody building or exploring or working in the world of emerging technology is get really clear on what you want to accomplish and who is it for. Because without knowing answers to those two questions, you can spend a lot of time and money uh, and not really have a whole lot to show for it. So it's thinking about where to build with the user in mind that really makes the world of difference. Hmm. So it sounds like you're almost educating the clients as you go. I think we educate each other and, and we learn the most from talking to users and seeing how users are engaging with what we create. And what's so interesting is that many times it's different from what we thought. We, we thought users would engage with something in a specific way, and then they end up pivoting. And the way that they're interacting with it or sharing it or connecting with friends over it is completely different from anything that we had imagined. And that's really fun to see as well, because I think it's it just kind of speaks to the way in which some of these new technologies, it's really like a new media for communication. So just like an author may write a book with one specific intention, you're going to have a myriad of readers that are getting at that from different angles. And they're seeing the author's intention, but they're putting their own spin on it or their own interpretation, or they're finding it resonate with their own life in different ways. So 
it is constantly evolving and it's really, it all comes back to the end user. Who are they? How are they using it? What needs is it meeting for them? And that then in turn shapes what we might recommend for the next client that we work with. I see. Very well explained. So one thing that you both mentioned that I find really interesting is the idea of timing as a roadblock, right? Is the industry ready for this? Are people are ready for this? Even if it's a great idea, but it takes 10 years for it to be ready. So um, Melissa, we'll start with you. I'm curious, what are your thoughts on the biggest roadblocks that you see to innovation in retail? I think because we think technology should be an immediate adaption. I think for, I know for us, give up sometimes too easily. So when we launched video shopping, it didn't take off right away. So instead of like keeping it on the back burner and still doing it, you know, day in and day out and week in and week out, we kind of like gave up on it. So I think that's one thing that we have to be cautious of, like even with the whole, with what's happening with NFTs, like that's something that I agree with Holly said, it's, something right now, but it's going to be something completely different in a couple of months from now. So I think, you know, we're kind of looking at it, knowing that we're going to go into it, but it's probably going to be something completely different than what we thought. And I think it is going to be more about um, customer rewards, that sort of thing, as opposed to what it, what it is right now. So going back to your question, what I think the roadblock is, is ourselves (laughs) sometimes. Don't be so quick to give up on technology because you think it's going to be the be all end all because everybody's talking about it. And if you don't get the results right away, still keep plugging away at it and don't give up so easily. Well said. So I know you were also recently at Shop Talk uh, Las Vegas. Can you share any of those insights that you got from attending this event? Um, I definitely say it's so great to be a live event. (laughs) I think virtual meetings and that I just I think are really especially when you're trying to meet with so many different people I think there was such a great energy in the room because people were live um it was pretty it was it was great seeing you know they have new code room people there too so it was a lot of fun so one of the big things that they were talking about was definitely live um how important that is I would say it's very confusing sometimes, um, especially when you are sort of a, you know, an independent owner and you're going there and you're seeing all the different things that you think you should be having in your tech stack. And it's really trying to go through, okay, what's really important and what can I bring in now? And then, so it's more of the planning out process, but I can even imagine for bigger countries, bigger companies, sorry, there's so much product. There's so many different apps that you feel that you should be using. And it's really going through the process of, you know, meeting them, finding out again, is my customer benefiting if I bring this in and how are they benefiting? So for me, it was a great eye opener. I'm having a ton of meetings right now after the show to find out, you know, what's useful, what's not useful and what should I be adding and how do I plan it into my cash flow? So I definitely want to go again next season. I might even go to the London one actually. Oh, when is that? That is in June. Just, um, again, just, I thought the talks were really informative. Um, and I think we're at a point after two years of kind of, even though we were adding a lot of technology during those two years of COVID, I think we're just on a bigger push even more because now we see what can happen with technology adding to our business. Like for me, I always thought I had to grow by adding in another store Now it's like, I don't think I have to add in another store. I can just go digitally. So now I want to go all into that. So we'll have to check back in with you after the June. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) That's great. Good. Well, it's interesting that you were talking also about the importance of live events when that's one of the founding principles of your store as well, is keeping it on site as well as online. Okay. So one other thing that we've seen is, you know, in addition to live events, there are a lot of new ways to do things. So Holly, I know that you're working a lot with virtual experiences and this is so fresh for so many people. What are a lot of the misconceptions or preconceptions that people have about this space and how would you like to reframe those for us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such a good question. Um, 
Melissa and I have had a lot of great conversations about this. I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that it has to be all or nothing, right? Like you're either going to invest half a million dollars and six to nine months in doing something massive, or you just might as well not even try. Um, But I think the reality is that this world is completely unexplored and it does not have to look, and it should not look the same from company to company, from user to user. I think one of the hardest things to ask people to do is actually to set aside their preconceptions of what it means to create a virtual experience or what it means to work with innovation, innovative technology. Um, and, and I think particularly in the business world, people are, really want to get to a solution fast. Mm-hmm. So they come into a room and either they're, they're, they're like on one of two pages, right? Either they come into the room and they're like, uh, it will look exactly like this and it will have these 10 features and they should do these things and there will be this many rooms and this is the outcome. Or they're like, we just don't know what to do. We don't know where to start. What does it mean? What, What can we do? So to ask people to actually stop and say, let's like zoom out, think big picture, think about your user, think about the business problems you're facing. Um, you tell us, like, what are we solving for here? Who is your user? What does she need? Let's talk about that. And then also to think through that what, what we might be able to create is probably bigger than what you have in your mind as a reference of this is what a digital experience looks like. So I'll give you a really interesting example. I'm working on a project right now. And last week, after many, many preliminary conversations, we kicked off the project. And one of the first things that they told me was, you know, uh, there was a big delay on this because we wanted to start with um, a look at our physical space. But in order to do that, there's parts that we didn't want to show. So we had to build walls so that we could capture it without showing those spaces. And I just like had this face oh moment God. because I was like, no, we can digitally put walls in there. You didn't need to spend that time or that money, like try to color match it, you know? We can drop a wall in there for you where there's no wall. It's fine. Just give us one and we can build out the rest. So to show that it's always possible and to show that it might not look like your other frames of reference for digital interfaces um, and just getting people to like enter that creative process and, and stop a little while in that realm of speculation or playing or how might we do this or what if. You know, everything that we think about or ideate together might not be viable, but it's going to give us a different angle to approach the project and to think about the end user. So I think that's the biggest thing is that it's just, it's very unknown and people don't know what to think about it. And and uncertainty is something that human beings are not really great with sitting in, Uh, but working in innovation properly, like assuming you're not just trying to copy what you saw somebody else do, it does require a certain level of comfort to sit with uncertainty and sit with speculation. I see. So conversations like this make me really excited for our upcoming event in October because, you know, we're having so much fun already (laughs) on an online call. And like Melissa said, how much better is it when we're in person together? So Melissa, I know that you're going to be a speaker for us. Can you give us a little sneak peek of your talk? I think it's more trying to give uh, comfort to the people and the businesses and business owners that are out there that you can be bringing digital change into your business without having to be tech savvy yourself. And it's, again, not letting that fear of, I don't know how to do this, stop you from your business of doing things. Because there's definitely, I know for, like I said, I'm not, I'm not, I've never put a background on, (laughs) you know, on a Zoom call before, but I'm still willing to try different things. So it's just sort of a little bit of the journey of the, you know, mistakes that I've made, but then the successes that I've had to be like, you've always got to be trying. And especially as a woman in business. And when I was a woman in a menswear business, it's like, you got to keep pushing forward and showing, you know what, I can do this. I think that's really needed for people to hear this because the world of technology as a whole is evolving so rapidly that nobody can be an expert in everything. No. So it's good to not let that stop you from trying and to not let that be too much of a fear factor to you innovating and going somewhere. Exactly. Good. Well, I can't wait to hear that full talk. (laughs) And Holly, I know that you have also hosted several of our webinars, our online live events. So I'm curious for you, how do you anticipate that translating to our live events? And 
you know, what are you most looking forward to? Oh my gosh. Well, I think at the beginning of this conversation, you said, Anna, that you feel like it's very rare and unusual when you meet someone that gets to bring their passion into what they do for a living. And I think Ewit for me has been one big eye opening that there are so many incredibly talented women that are pursuing their passions and that are very successful in the process. Um, and it's the highlight of my of my day, of my week, of my month, when we get to have these kinds of conversations. And I come away every time just feeling so inspired. And, you know, like meeting Melissa in person last fall was incredible. I just felt like, oh my God, this is the coolest woman. I want her to be my big sister. Like, please adopt me, Melissa. <laughs> you know, but you just, you get that sense of like who people are in a, in a richer way, in a mm-hmm. deeper way. And these conversations are already so rewarding that I just can't wait to put physical faces to names yep. and, and, you know, like share a hug or share a meal together and, and relate in that sense, because I am constantly so inspired by all the women that we get to talk to. And like the thought of having everybody under one roof is a I little know. bit mind blowing. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't wait. I can't wait. I, I totally agree with that. Cause we've been you know, we've done virtuals with everybody. We've kind of, you know, we had a few dinners in Toronto. So I think it's just leading up to it that when we see each other in person again, it's going to be, it's going to be one big party. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's interesting too, to note the fact that, um, you know, you've both talked a lot about how innovation is all centered around a real problem and the real problem to know what that is, to know what people need, you have to know your users. And I think it's just interesting to come full circle again and say that for us as, as leaders, as innovators, we need to be together because relationship is really at the heart of, of what inspires us to do the work that we do every day. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it as well. And um, I know, you know, I'm really excited too. I wanted to ask this question and I wasn't sure if we'd have time for it, but I want to ask you both, who is a woman who inspires you? Besides Melissa. <laughs> Besides Holly? <laughs> I don't know. You can talk about each other in the third. <laughs> I have Honestly, to say, it's very, it's very, oh, go ahead, Melissa. Well, I'm I just want to say that ever since sort of um, when I was first approached to be on the first podcast and meeting some of the women from this group, because I think you, as an entrepreneur, you are in a bubble all the time because you don't want to talk about any problems that you're having with your friends because everything always has to be perfect and everything's got to be good. So I definitely think the work that Avenue is doing is, is great bringing all these women together. And I've definitely met some great women that I'm just like, wow, I'm really like, it's exactly what Holly's saying. Like you're meeting women that are like, wow, I can't believe what you're doing. Like it's pretty, it's really impressive. And I think as women entrepreneurs, we really need more and more role models all the time. And I think this is something that this, uh, this is going to do as well. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I think it's, uh, it's actually quite hard to point to one person um, because I feel like I've met so many incredible women throughout this initiative. But I think one person who really does stand out in my mind is Uliana. So Uliana is our chief Mm -hmm. revenue officer and, um, I remember from her first day in Avenue Co, just this energy that she brought with her of discovery and possibility and wanting to see the best in people and opening them up and and sharing vulnerabilities in a way that we could lift each other up. This is so rare and so special. And, And when I think about the whole extraordinary women in tech, it was really her brainchild. And so for me, she kind of, she kind of symbolizes what stands behind all of it, which is just celebrating and discovering and lifting each other up as women in business, women in technology, um, and bringing so much joy to these conversations and just coming away inspired, you know, she's this incredible woman. She's, she's beautiful. She has her own successful business. She's a mother, she's a wife, she's a incredible employee. Um, and I've never once felt cattiness from her. I've never once felt Mm -hmm. like a sense of competitive competition she just is really genuinely wanting to lift people up and I think that's so special it's so priceless so I, I'd have to choose Uliana as the woman who inspires me <laughs> that's very true and I've experienced this yeah. as well every time I'm with Uliana yep I just saw her in Toronto actually just briefly when they were yes. in town 
Bless but like, again, they were doing such a great, they were doing another amazing dinner, bringing another, you know, another group of amazing women in. So, and then doing interviews as well, too. So I think just the way that they, you guys go about their business, mm-hmm. it's uh, nobody's really doing that because everyone's just wanting your business without really getting to know who or what your business is. Yeah. So I do think it's something different that Avenue Code does do. Well, thank you, Melissa, for that. Well, we're, we're just going to have to bring in your idea of shots and then we'll have. Okay. <laughs> well, that's happening in San Francisco. You know that. <laughs> yeah, so come join us in San Francisco. <laughs> it's going to be a fun time. Yep. <laughs> well, Melissa and Holly, thank you so much for joining us today. And I can't wait to see you at the conference in October. And thanks to everybody who tuned in as well. Uh, we'll see you on the next episode of the Avenue Code Spotlight Series podcast. And in the meantime, be sure to check out our other interviews with the same series on our blog at avenuecode.com. You can also check out other conversations like this on YouTube at Extraordinary Women in Tech. Thank you. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. See you in the next episode of the Avenue Code Extraordinary Women in Tech podcast. Be sure to check out the interviews from the same series on our blog at avenuecode.com. See ya.